Finding Felicity by Lewis Kirk Chapter 2 Looking out on a cloudless evening from the roof of the St Anselm's Tower Block, the panoramic view was spectacular. To the southeast, you could see the arch of Wembley Stadium, and beyond that, on the horizon, the Shard of London. In every direction, you could see for miles around, from the pinnacle of this giant block of flats. The view from the ground was equally striking, but for different reasons. George cut through an alleyway off the main road and walked through a desolate kid's playground. There were several cars parked up at the bottom of the immense housing block, one on bricks missing its wheels, one emitting a strong perfume of marijuana, and one unrecognisably burnt out. He arrived at his front door out of breath after having walked up the sixteen flights of stairs. The lifts had never worked, and likely never would. He entered and surveyed the flat, which was not in as much of a mess as he remembered. Perhaps tiredness masked his expectations. Looking through the cupboards for something to eat, all he could find was a tin of baked beans and a few slices of mouldy bread. Tearing off any tiny blue spots from the crusts, he toasted them and warmed the beans in the microwave. Sitting down to this simple meal, he picked up his knife and fork, and suddenly heard a low muffled scratching at the front door. What could be making that noise, he thought? There it was again, a distinct scratching sound. Could it be a giant rat, George thought? Possibly a cat or a dog? Something intent on entering, and then what? Finally, the scratch-scratch noise ceased and was followed by the sound of a key turning in the lock, and in stumbled Mum. Mary, often self-medicated with alcohol, she led a stressful existence, and it was an ideal means of blunting the sharp edges of life. Shuffling into the kitchen and over to the counter, she didn't even notice George sitting in the corner with his dinner. George watched in silence as she took a mug out of the cupboard and the twenty centiliter red imitation vodka from her bag and began to pour out a measure. All right, Mum. The stream of vodka stopped mid-flow and the bottle was placed on the counter. Mary whirled round and faced George with a startled expression on her tired face. George, I didn't see you there. You frightened the life out of me. Nearly gave me a heart attack. My heart is beating like a drum. Is everything all right, Mum? Are you drinking again? Yeah, but it's only a tiny bottle, though. Just needed to take the edge off. I've had a shit day at work. The reply came with a clear sense of guilt, perceptible in the words. You'll never guess what my manager had the cheek to say to me at work today. He called me into his office and wanted to speak to me about my performance. Said I ain't working fast enough. I said what? You've been monitoring me, have you? Spying on me? Her voice was building in volume and irritation. Do you know how he'd been monitoring my performance, George? How he knew I wasn't working to the required company standards? No, go on, Mum. I haven't got a clue, George responded with genuine intrigue. The bloody robot I work alongside flagged it up. A dumb machine notified the manager that I was taking too long to take the items off it so it could go and collect more. A bloody robot reported me and got me in trouble. I can't believe this. What's the world coming to? George recollected the time when the robots were first brought into the factory his mum worked in. It was all over the local papers. The CEO said it would improve delivery fulfilment times and reduce prices. The usual rhetoric that accompanied automation. That was a year ago now and things had clearly gotten out of hand. He looked at his mum with judgment in his eyes and was about to preach some wisdom about mindfulness and acceptance when, just as the words were about to leave his lips, he stopped himself. For some reason, George thought better than to lecture his mum about how she could reduce her suffering by certain psychological techniques and instead focused his energy on his own response and tried to be completely present in the room with his dear mum. Oh no, Mum, that's terrible. Surely the robot should be subservient to us humans, and not the other way round. I'm really sorry to hear about that, Mum. You would think so, wouldn't you? It's bloody Terminator 2 Judgment Day in my warehouse, 
Next, they'll be killing us off if we fall below company standards, Mary said, with a weak smile barely perceptible in her lips, but clear enough in her sparkling eyes. That's funny, Mum. It's great you can see the funny side of things. If I ain't laughing, I'll be crying, George. And I ain't going to be shedding no tears for a company that only sees me as a national insurance number on a spreadsheet. That's for damn sure. She yawned a huge yawn, open-mouthed and at full stretch, like a cat upon awakening. I'm tired, darling. Been a stressful day. Going to bed now. She walked across the kitchen and gave George a kiss on the forehead that radiated warmth and affection like only a mother's love can. Then she was gone. George was alone in the kitchen and rather sleepy too. He decided to get a shower and think about getting some rest. Toweling himself off in his bedroom with one hand, he used the other to open the YouTube app on his smartphone and search for Plato's Fado audio ebook being read on his favourite YouTube channel. Before he got comfortable, he remembered to set his alarm for early the next morning in order to review the notes on eudaimonia for tomorrow's lecture. He placed the phone on charge next to his bed, turned out the light, and in five minutes was fast asleep. While sleeping, the entire dialogue of the Phaedo played into his ear, deeper than his physiology into the subconscious mind, and deeper than his subconscious mind directly into his soul. There have been many scientific studies on hypnopedia, and George would often drift into sleep, listening to some book or other. He regularly found the following day that fortuitous passages would come into his mind completely by association and at random. Much of the time, they were extremely helpful to whatever argument or conversation he was having. The alarm buzzed at 7am. Snooze. Again at 7.10. Snooze. This went on until 8am and had eaten into any time that George had scheduled to prepare his mind for the day's lecture. Intention is a curious thing. One part of us sets an intention, waking up early or going for a run, for example, but it's a completely different part of us who has to cash that cheque and perform the action. George had observed this phenomena regularly over recent years and wondered how much more he would get done if there weren't so many different and conflicting parts of himself, if he were one whole being. He would be practically Superman if he followed through with every intention that he formed, but for the moment his will was weak and the comfort of his duvet was far more soothing than his notebook. OK, class, settle down, please, settle down, Professor Ospensky announced from the front of the room. Susan, put your phone away, please. Alan, you won't need your laptop today. We are simply reviewing some concepts before moving on to what is a good life. The lecture hall was grand and resembled more of an amphitheatre than a classroom and was the ideal environment to give and receive a lecture. I would like you all to think back to our module on Vedanta philosophy and a lecture on the teachings of the Upanishads. It would be timely to review the main tenets of this text, as they are a wonderful lens with which to view the world, for the religious and the secular alike. I will briefly describe the Sanskrit term, its translation, and then comment on what this relates to in Western philosophical and Judeo-Christian thought. He picked up his chalk turned to face the blackboard, and began. Number one, Brahman, the Godhead, the underlying supreme reality of all existence, the one of the Platonic philosophers, God of the Jew, Christian, and Muslim. For secular thinkers, you can view this as the fundamental principle of creation and the foundations of physics. Two, Atman, the divine core of the personality, the soul of Western thought. Aristotle would describe it as the character or personality, and this has come down to us in modern psychology in the form of the ego or id. 3. Dharma The law which expresses and maintains the unity of creation. For the philosopher it would be divine providence. For the Abrahamic follower the word of God. Ultimately the laws that underlie the universe. 4. Karma, the web of cause and effect. In Western thought, we see this in the principle of the golden rule, 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For the secular scientists, it would be viewed as a number of concepts, free will, destiny, determinism and the like. The difference is that the Eastern lens believes that our actions influence our life and future, whereas a determinist sees things as being predetermined, which I find quite depressing. 5. Samsara, the cycle of birth and death. The Greeks refer to it as the transmigration of the soul. The Jew, Christian and Muslim view it as the physical world, life as we know it, and the contrast between creation and paradise. 6. Moksha, the spiritual liberation that is life's supreme goal, the pinnacle of all Eastern traditions. For the religions of the West who believe this state can only be achieved after we die if we are lucky enough to go to heaven. Certain esoteric sects think differently, but the orthodox majority think we can only achieve this state once we have left our physical bodies. In Western thought it would be viewed as becoming self-realised, achieving gnosis, or freedom from ignorance. So that should have triggered your memories of the study module in which we covered these concepts, and with this in mind, who would like to speculate what a good life consists of? The lecture hall broke out into a concert of conversations, students discussing among themselves what the concepts Professor Uspensky had just laid out meant to them. As this was going on, the professor went to get himself a drink of water and allowed the discussion to run out of steam of its own accord before addressing the group. As the noise fell to a low tremor, someone began the discussion. I think said Jeff, a young man with the latest trainers and sports jacket. I think, this time said with more volume and force, so that everyone in the room knew that he was addressing each and every one of them, that a good life is the acquiring of material possessions, a nice house, a great car, beautiful wife, and the money to go where you want, when you want. That, to me, would be a good life. Ospensky was surprised to hear such a materialistic answer, and stood in a slight trance while he considered the ramifications of this thought. After a time he shook himself out of his stupor, physically shook his head very gently to get back into the room. OK, Jeff, very nice, clearly a natural capitalist. But where would this philosophy fall into our six concepts I have laid out on the board here? Master in samsara, sir. The more money you have, the more stuff you can get, the happier you will be. I myself don't believe there is anything that goes on after we die, so I want to get all of my living done and out the way before I pop my clogs and experience this life to the full. Very nice, Jeff, very nice, Professor Ospensky said, struggling to mask his sarcasm. Anyone else? Try and keep in mind the six concepts I have written up here on the board when answering. For me, sir, I see Krishna in all things. He is the supreme Godhead, and at the same time the super-soul that animates all living things, said Sarita, who attended every religious festival that occurred at the local ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness Center. He is at the same time Brahman and Atman, and the one who bestows moksha on his devotees. Hare Krishna! someone shouted from the back of the class, with mockery and derision. Who said that? Police Dispensky, searching the back row for the culprit like a hawk. In this class we accept each and every person's individual right to believe what they feel is the truth. There are many truths in this life, and we just happen to call them by different names. Another word out of you back there, and I will have to ask you to leave. Have I made myself clear? He paused for dramatic effect, before asking Sarita to go on. That's all, sir. Just love Krishna and see him in everything. She wanted to go on and share more about her path, but the bully had made her self-conscious and doubtful, and she just wanted to be out of the spotlight. I believe in agency. Submit to Allah and follow the Prophet, Ali shouted out, interrupting a fellow student, which clearly annoyed Professor Ospensky. Now, Ali, surely you know better than to interrupt? Stephen had already started his discourse and you shouted over him. Ali's up next, but we don't shout over people in here. Everyone will get their chance to share if they want to. Continue, please, Stephen. 
I believe in the agency of human beings to make the right choice individually and collectively without the need of some divine or supernatural overseer. The moral code of ethics is a hard road to follow, but by making the right choice, meaning what benefits both the individual and the society in which they make up a small part, the world will be a better place and humanity can thrive. Very good, Stephen. The humanist approach, Professor Ospensky agreed. Now, Ali, what was it you were saying? Something about God? Not God, Allah, sir. The best life is one lived in submission to the Almighty and following in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We've got the five pillars of Islam that we follow and that guarantee us entry to paradise, prayer, faith, alms, fasting and pilgrimage. It's very clear to me, Professor, and I have the one true path before me. Ali spoke with certainty, determination and passion. It was quite inspiring for those students who were yet to form a world view that incorporated a spiritual aspect. His belief was intoxicating and his confidence inspirational. George felt a strong desire to participate in the discussion, but his mind was scattered. All of the concepts that the professor had written out on the board, added to by the students' statements about what a good life meant to them, had left his thoughts in an uncontrollable tailspin. What could he possibly say to impact the discussion? There were as many differing opinions and viewpoints as there were persons in the room. He began to draw inward, to move away from his physical reality, the reality of the room and the people, towards an interior perception where thought, space and time were less distinct and more malleable. This inner reality felt more real to him than anything else, and in this state of consciousness he began to contemplate. In every religion that we have learnt about so far there has been a point of beginning, a Genesis story, George pondered. Even the scientists have the Big Bang, and Aristotle spoke about the unmoved mover, if this is true, then everything in existence is connected, from the great beginning, the divine spark of creation, to the vast galaxies and down to the smallest atom, and then you could even go subatomic. This thought caused him to shake his head at the unfathomable nature of this idea. But what is a good life, and a good life for all, not just for one individual? I remember Aristotle speaking about the nature of human life is to be happy, and Plato spoke about the good, and that all things move towards goodness. Sarita looks very happy, and she is a good person, so maybe Krishna is goodness, manifested in some other form. God is good. At this final assumption, a wave of emotion swept over George's entire being. It wasn't some base pleasure, or some sweet sensation. This train of thought had caused him to feel an intense state of serenity, something he had never felt before now, so vivid and real. At this all-consuming feeling, the thought of trying to share it, or convince anyone in the room of its validity, seemed so stupid and trivial. They wouldn't understand. Why would they? There was a vast cavern of difference between the God of books and the God of experience. Inner peace remained for the rest of the day, Throughout the lunch break, with everyone's open discussion and opinions of the previous class, throughout the second lecture of the day, where Professor Ospensky was helping them to finalise and clean up their dissertations, and all throughout the journey home. Everything seemed to be just as it should be. Perfect. Nothing was out of place. Nothing could have been different, or other than it was in the moment.